Well, good morning, Safe Harbor. Welcome to our Sunday School class. A few quick announcements as we get started. First, there will be no Sunday School class next week. Uh, I will be out of town back in Ohio visiting my family with Natalie and Belle, and so we will not have Sunday School next week. Then the following week, Assuming that everything goes smooth with the phase three opening as the governor has instructed, uh, we will be attempting to get back into doing Sunday school at church. Uh, I'll be posting announcements on the Facebook page, etc., uh, based on the regulations, but that is the plan for now. If something changes, I will let you know. We will, if we have to continue with the videos, we will. Uh, but I'd like to get back into doing it at church. If we do do it at church, I will continue to film these and post them for those of you that are watching them via YouTube uh, as well. So let's go ahead and pray and then we'll get started on 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 to 20. Uh, today's an interesting passage. Uh, May not take us the whole time, but we'll see what happens. So, God, we thank you for this day. God, we just pray that as we continue to look at this great book of First Thessalonians, that you would be able to take things and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so First Thessalonians 2, 13 to 20. Verse 13 starts with uh, Paul speaking here. And we also thank God constantly for this. That when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. So we see a couple of big important points as we go through verse 13. First, the Thessalonians accepted the Bible as the word of God. You might say, Pastor Daniel, that seems kind of obvious. Of course the Bible is the word of God. But unfortunately... Critical scholars, uh, you know, the people at your big universities, at your liberal seminaries, uh, the average person would argue, no, the Bible is not the word of God. The Bible is merely words written down by men in the ancient world. What they thought God said or, or what they thought about God or, or they pretended to be God or the, and these kinds of things. They, they try to argue no, the Bible is not the Word of God. Why do they do this? Because if the Bible is just what Paul thought and what John thought and what Isaiah thought and what Moses thought and all this kind of stuff, and it's not actually the words of God, these men were not inspired by the Holy Spirit, then they lose the authority. It's just, oh, well, you know. I mean, it's no, that this book is no different than the other religious books of the day. The, the Book of Mormon, the Quran, the, uh, all these other holy books. There's, there's nothing that makes it any different. Accepting the Bible as the Word of God is the first, I would say it's the number one priority in the life of a Christian. You might say, well, what about salvation? Well, it's almost impossible to get saved if you don't trust that the Bible is the Word of God. I mean, if you say, I, I don't really trust that book. You know, Jesus is not walking around today to listen to. You have to trust that what the Bible says is true, what that it's accurate, that it really, this is what Jesus really said, this is what Isaiah really said, and these people were spoke for God, this kind of stuff. And so, if you do not accept the Bible as the Word of God, everything else falls apart. A lot of liberal denominations that have kind of caved into some of these things, they're dying. Why? Because if you don't think the Bible is the Word of God, you're not going to witness. You're not really going to trust it. You're not going to think it's special. And so it, it, it leads to a very slippery slope, and not, that's ultimately what happens. The Bible itself argues that it's not simply the author's words, but they were under the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for four different aspects. 
2 uh, Peter 1.21 talks about the Holy Spirit moved the writers of the Spirit. Uh, you've got a lot of passages in the Old Testament where it's, it's as if God is speaking through these prophets. And so, and so you, the Bible, if you don't start with this, it leads to massive problems. Almost you can't, I would say you cannot even really be a Christian if you do not accept the Bible as the word of God. It, it just, everything breaks down. You might say that you're a Christian, you might <laughs> try and do some stuff, but it, ultimately your, your view, your walk is not going to be sustainable if you do not view the Bible as the true word of God. Then Paul says, For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God and Christ Jesus that are in Judea. So it's like, hey, you guys are looks very similar to these other churches, the churches in Judea, that would have been the church in Jerusalem uh, and the surrounding areas. And you say, what, what, what is the significance of that? Some of these people try to make it seem like Paul and the church at Jerusalem were at odds. There's something called hyper-dispensationalism that says, you know, oh, Paul had the true gospel, the apostles had a, the, had a, a gospel of works or a fake gospel or, or something like that. And, and they try to pit Paul against the apostles. And say, you never get that in the Bible. There is one passage in Galatians chapter 2 where Paul calls Peter out for his actions, but it's it's because he was doing something wrong, not because he was believing something wrong. In fact, in Galatians chapter 1, they, they show that they agree on their theology and on their teaching. So there's no, you never get the idea that Paul... And the church and the Gentile and the predominantly Gentile churches ever had an argument or were at odds with the church of Jerusalem. In fact, as Paul was going around, there are several occurrences where Paul gathers up offerings from these other churches that he's dealing with and sends it back to Jerusalem because he knows they're under persecution and getting attacked. And so I, it doesn't, that doesn't seem to be the case. If Paul thought they were some kind of false teachers or something, there's no way he would have done that. In great respect for his fellow apostles, and the church of Jerusalem served as one of the leading churches with the church at Antioch. You kind of have two wings of the mission movement. The church of Jerusalem serves as the main church in their region, trying to reach predominantly the Jews. Church at Antioch then becomes the sending church of Paul. They send him out, him and Barnabas originally, and then him and Silas and Timothy and all these people out to the Gentile churches. So it's not that they're rival churches. They're, it's not like it's their first Baptist at Bedford and, and Antioch is second Baptist at Bedford and they're trying to compete or go at it. No, no, they're working together in order to to reach their own perspective options and be like if we were working with a church in Danville uh, of similar faith, you know, we're going to try and reach the people in Bedford. They're going to try and reach the people in Danville. We may work together, but doesn't and but doesn't mean that we're some kind of rivalry or something. It's just we are going to focus on what we can do. That's essentially what he's saying. Then he expands that. He says, how did they imitate them? For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets. So what Paul is saying here is first, he's saying that the Gentiles in Thessalonica basically treated the, the same Gentiles in the same way that the unsaved Jews treated the same saved Jews. There was a lot of persecution going on on both sides. And he's saying, look, you guys are you guys suffered persecution just like Jewish believers suffered persecution, and you survived. He, you know, he, he's basically arguing this. Then he says this that from the as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets. You kind of have this idea of throughout the scriptures, that the Jewish people had a history of ignoring or even persecuting their own leaders and prophets. whole list of people you could talk about. Isaiah, called the prince of the prophets, was largely ignored during his time. 
In fact, uh, church history tells us he was probably sawed in half. Book of he Hebrews may mention this. By Manasseh, the king, the own king. Saw, possibly sawed Isaiah in half because he didn't want to hear what he had to say. Elijah, Elijah was persecuted by Ahab and Jezebel, the, their king, the northern kings. He's the main prophet, and he's getting attacked by his own king. Jeremiah had been thrown in a pit. He's arrested. He's chained up in the courtyard. He's beaten. He's slapped by the high priest. I mean, this is the prophet of God, and he's going to get attacked. John the Baptist had been killed by King Herod, who was the king of the Jews at the time. Jesus had been crucified. And then finally, Stephen and James had been killed in the persecution. So you see this, this constant theme, not something that was new. This had happened. Uh, I mean, Elijah's almost a thousand, almost uh, 800 BC, somewhere around there. Say 700, 800 BC. Isaiah 700 BC. You're talking about for literally hundreds of years, the Jews had been ignoring their prophets, persecuting them, uh, not listening to what they had to say. Paul said, and, and the Jews drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. I'd say, what is Paul talking about here? The Jews were not simply against Christianity. They were actively involved in trying to destroy it. And this is a significant difference. You can say, I don't like a business. Pick a business, whatever. I'm not a big fan. You can say, I don't really like Amazon. I, I don't like their politics, or I don't like they run small businesses out, or, or whatever. You, not, now, this is not me. I buy stuff from Amazon all the time. But say you don't like Amazon. I'm just using them as an example. It's one thing to say, oh, I don't really like Amazon. I'm not going to shop at Amazon. Okay. It'd be completely different if you say, I don't like Amazon. I'm not going to shop at Amazon. I'm going to try to convince all my friends not to shop at Amazon. I'm going to write bad reviews on everything that I can find at Amazon. I'm going to write op-ads against them in the paper. I'm going to do, you know, if you're actively trying to, there's a difference between being against something and actively trying to destroy it. The Jews were not just like, okay, we don't believe Jesus was the Messiah, so we're just not going to buy it. They're like, we don't believe Jesus was the Messiah. And we're going to kill you guys if you guys keep telling everybody he was. This is essentially what happens. How does Paul know this? Paul himself had been at the forefront of this and knew exactly what they were doing. Paul is probably thinking, hey, I know what they're doing. I was the one that started this, if you will. He, he was really the first leader of this persecution back when it started. He was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians. He was at the stoning of Stephen. He had killed people and had arrested people and all this stuff. So he's like, I, I know what they're doing. I know why they're doing it. I was in their shoes. I know exactly what is going on. They are trying to destroy Christianity. And he's like, that, that can't happen. It just can't happen. They are against God because of doing this. You might say, what is he talking about with the wrath? Uh, Jesus himself predicted that Jew Jerusalem would be destroyed in 70 AD and the Jews would be homeless for centuries. And that's what happened. The Romans came and destroyed it in Jerusalem in 70 AD. For 1900 years, the Jews didn't have a home. However, Paul did see a future for them. Romans chapter 9 through 11. There's other passages in Paul and, the, and Matthew and, and other places. Where they say, you know, yes, they're for a time they have turned against, but they will come back to God. And so it's not that Paul is saying God is done with the Jews, but he is saying that they are going they're in a time of wrath, a time of distress. I believe, personally believe this will happen until the the rapture and the tribulation. During the tribulation, the book of Revelation talks about there being hundred and forty four thousand Jews who convert to Christianity and then become witness. I think that's when the Jewish nation will turn back to Christ. But uh, regardless of that, they are suffering currently. They, uh, during, during Paul's time and for many years, they were suffering the wrath of God for their rejection of Christ. 
<laughs> Paul says, but since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, meaning he, he had to leave and to run away from Thessalonica, they, they had to leave for their flee for their lives. In person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. So he's saying, look, we want to see you again. I didn't run away because I didn't have anything to say. I wanted I ran away from for personal protection. Then he concludes with this. Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. So Paul saying, look, I, we, we kept trying to come back and see you, but Satan hindered us. Well, it's not because we didn't want to see you. In fact, you are our joy. When, we, when people say, hey, what did you do for Christ? We point to you and say, we founded this church in Thessalonica, and they have done great work for the Lord. Now, what is this about Paul and, and, and Satan? Does Paul, what does Paul mean when he says Satan hindered him? Does he mean literally? Some people get all confused with this. They're like, what is this talking about when Paul says Satan hindered us? I think there's kind of two options, and it may be a both and type thing. First, Paul does say that Satan buffeted his body. Might have been something similar to Job. Where Paul, you know, if you read the book of Job, God allowed Satan to attack Job's body. Paul says he had a thorn in his flesh, that Satan buffeted his body. That It seemed like Satan may have had been able to physically attack Paul in some way, through disease or some type of thing. That's a possibility. I, I think that, that clearly Satan did that, but I'm not sure if that's what Paul is talking about in this particular instance. Instead, I think it's this. Satan also seemed to be behind the Jewish movement to destroy the church. The Jews are just adamant. They're, they're trying what everything they can do. It seems that Satan is working behind the scenes trying to get this out. He knows if I can destroy the church, I can destroy the mission of God. And so he tries to do it. In the early in the church, the Romans did not really persecute the church. It was the Jewish people who persecuted the church. It was Saul. It was uh, later on, Paul is going to get attacked by the Jews. Paul gets stoned by the Jews. But all this time, it's Jews, 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 Jews. However, once that kind of dies down, right around 50 AD or so, not that the Jews don't stop trying to persecute the Christians, that, that still continues. But then all of a sudden it's like Satan shifts and the Romans then start to persecute. Under Nero, under these other things, Peter is beheaded by the Romans. Paul, or Peter is crucified by the Romans. Paul is beheaded by the Romans. You know, a lot of the church martyrs and the early church fathers are all killed by Roman persecution. It's not for 300 years. It's not complete persecution. It's not like every moment of every day they were persecuted. But for a period of 300 years until Constantine, there's periods of really strong persecution by the Roman government. Then Constantine, you know, in 300, suppose, and around 330, I think it is, something like that, uh, Claims to convert to Christianity. I'm not sure he did or not, but he becomes more favorable of Christianity and the persecution stops for the most part. Uh, but for literally hundreds of years, Satan used first the Jews and then the Romans to try and destroy the church in whatever way possible. And Paul here saying, look, I tried to keep coming back to you, but I knew that the Jews were going to kill me if I went back to your town. And, I kept, and then he kept blocking me from doing this. All right, so one last slide here that I think, or two last slides. Uh, is Paul being anti-Semitic? You might say, man, he's really harsh to the Jews in this passage. Why is, is Paul being anti-Semitic? Is he, is he being anti-Jewish in this? Is he, is he attacking the Jews unfairly or, or being persecuting them? First, Paul himself was a Jew. So he's like, I, I'm not being anti-Semitic. I'm, I'm a Jewish myself. I did this. I know what they're going through. He's not like he's uh, being racist or something like that against the Jews. But Paul and Paul believed in a future for the Jewish people. So it wasn't like he was like, oh, God has abandoned the Jews. 
Uh, the church has replaced Israel, these kinds of ideas that are even in our culture today are very prevalent. But Paul knew what the Jews were doing because he himself had been in their place. I think that's one of the reasons why he's so harsh to them is he's saying, look, I know what they're doing. I did it. And it only took a radical act of God, God's intervention at the road to Damascus for me to change my view. And so he's saying, it's like, look, I know they're, they're doing this because they really hate Christianity and they're really in opposition to God. Unfortunately, some Christians throughout history have taken these types of passages wrong, and it has led to anti-Semitism. Like they read some of this stuff and they go, oh yeah, see, the, 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 it was the Jews that killed Jesus, and it was the Jews who did this, and so they persecuted the Jews. And during the Crusades, they would go and murder every Jew that they could find. Uh, Luther, who was a great Christian man and, and did a lot for the church, later in his life became very anti-Semitic and wrote a lot of hateful things against the Jews, unfortunately. And a lot of that became foundational in Germany to the point that it ultimately, when Hitler came on the scene, it wasn't like Hitler just said, oh, I hate the Jews and I'm going to kill them all. And nobody else thought that. The reason it was successful is most of Germany thought that because it had been embedded in their mindset for hundreds of years from Luther and others who had been festering this. And so when Hitler comes on the scene and says, let's kill all the Jews, they're like, yeah, let's do it. And so we have to be very careful. You can be, say the Jews, Judaism as a religion is no longer true. It is ignoring their Messiah. <clears throat> they are not doing what they're called to do. But it doesn't mean that we have to be a, Offensive to Jews, attack Jews, persecute Jews, uh, do the kind of stuff that has happened throughout church history. That is completely wrong and should not be tolerated. I think that's what Paul would have said. So, three applications. First, we need to trust God's word. We saw that in, in the verse, first verse in 13. If we don't trust God's word, we have lost our foundation. We lose our ability to do anything, really. And, and because we don't have God's word available to us. Second, persecution will come, but it's not the end. They had to deal with the, the Thessalonians were dealing with persecution. Paul was dealing with persecution. The church in Jerusalem was dealing with persecution. In the early church, basically everybody was dealing with persecution. It was just a a, a fact of life. It was if you became a Christian, you were going to be persecuted. You know, in America, we we have kind of taken for granted that we have freedoms and if anyone says and attacks us, we go, oh man, they're persecuting us. Well, yeah, that, that's just kind of part of the game as Christians. Now, now should we uh, in America have rights and, and, and fight for to keep these rights and, and these kinds of things as in, in, in a godly way? Certainly. But ultimately, you're not going to live a Christian life without dealing with persecution. Thankfully, in America, we don't have this type of persecution that is around the world, where you can literally be killed, even today, for being a Christian. India, China, all in Africa. There's a lot of places in the world today that if you're a Christian, they will kill you. We don't have to deal with that in America at this time. And But persecution, it will come, but it's not the end. And finally, we have an enemy in Satan who will stop at nothing to try and destroy the church. Sometimes we forget Satan's there. We go, oh yeah, we, Satan, yeah, he's this guy in a red suit and with a little pitchfork and we don't really have to deal with him. No, Satan is a true spiritual entity who's out there who's trying to destroy the church and we have to be on guard for him. We have to know he's, I think that he's behind a lot of what's going on in our culture today and seeking to destroy the church and we have to be on our guard to, against his attacks. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. God, we pray that as we learn from our message today, our, our study today, that we would trust your word, and we know that you have passed this word along for literally thousands of years in some cases. And that we can trust that it is your word that is what you want us to read and understand each day. You know, we pray that as persecution comes into our lives, that we would stand strong, that we would not give in to what the world says is great, 
but that we would be faithful to you. God, and that we would be able to stand against these attacks of Satan and his forces, who he's manipulating, who he's attacking, whatever he is doing, that we would stand strong. In Jesus' name, amen.